Well, good morning. Hey, uh, my name's Austin. Uh, I uh, used to be here with you guys quite a bit. It's, uh, I'm very glad to be here. I, I used to be a part of your guys' team. I was out here for two years under Pastor Tyler, and I got to tell you, for weeks, knowing that this uh, pulpit swap was going to be happening, this date has been on my calendar, because whenever I get to come out to Redwood, it always just feels like a coming home party. You guys are just an awesome, 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 awesome church, and, uh, and so I'm so pleased to be a part of, of River Valley, and r- really River Valley Redwood. Um, like I said, I was out here for two years, uh, part of Pastor Tyler's team. Uh, I was uh, kind of helping him serve, and then about two, uh, not two months, but about a, f- a few months ago... Um, you guys sent me out and a group of people to go and be a part of a team that was going to start a church in Rogue River. And so uh, that's where I've been for the last uh, few months now. And uh, I, I got to tell you guys, uh, God, is, God is doing cool things. And I want to thank you guys for your prayers. Um, right now in Rogue River, we are at uh, two service times. And so um, praise the Lord for that, uh, just like you guys, 9 and 10, 30. And so they're, they're doing it right now. And so uh, that, that's exciting. And then right now we're, we're, we're prayerfully considering what it would look like to be adding a a uh, Saturday night third service. And so um, I just want to thank you guys. You guys are with us in more ways than you know, um, in your prayers and in your uh, occasionally showing up and encouraging us, the Hammer Crew. Thank you guys for that. And, and so I just want to thank you guys for, um, for sending us out and praying for us out in Rogue River. Um, it, it's a huge, huge blessing. And so uh, before we get rolling, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to be with us. And then we will hop into the message today. So let's bow our heads and let's ask the Lord to be with us. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for the way that Um, Your Holy Spirit moves, and your Holy Spirit impacts our lives. I thank you for this church out here in Redwood. I thank you for Pastor Tyler and uh, the ministry that he has and um, the gifts that you have given him. Uh, Father, I ask that during this next 30 or so minutes today, Father, your Holy Spirit would move powerfully, and it would compel our hearts to worship and love you. Uh, Thank you for the season of Advent, and I pray, God, that we would learn more about your character here today and fall deeper in love with you. That's what matters. We love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I think that there is something endearing about a super rich person who lives a relatively normal lifestyle, right? Like somebody who has a ton of money but still wears Levi's 501 jeans, or uh, who shops at JCPenney's, or who goes to TJ Maxx and Ross to find discount deals, who wakes up at 6 a.m. and goes out on Black Friday to fight the crowds for half off a 65-inch flat-screen Vizio TV, something like that. I think a great example of a super rich person who lives a relatively normal lifestyle is a guy by the name of Warren Buffett. There's a picture of Warren Buffett. Uh, Some of you might already know who he is, but simply put, Warren Buffett is known as the world's greatest investor. In fact, right now, Warren Buffett is the fourth richest person in the world. Fourth richest person in the world. And here's how much he is worth. Right now, Warren Buffett is worth north of $85 billion. $85 billion. Yes, you heard that correctly. That is billion with a B. That is big bucks. That's $85 billion more dollars than I have. Like, like this dude is wealthy. But for the most part, when we look at Warren Buffett, he sort of looks like and lives his life like a relatively normal dude. Like, if we were to see this jolly fellow walking down the street, we would think that he's maybe the type of guy who would dress up as Santa Claus and go down to a local elementary school and allow kids to sit on his lap and take pictures with him. He looks very normal. In fact, his life really is pretty ordinary. For instance, he was married to the wife of his youth for over 50 years until she passed away in 2004. For breakfast, this is interesting, for breakfast every single day, he hops in the driver's seat of his 2005 Cadillac and goes to his local McDonald's where he orders a sausage egg McMuffin and a large Coke. Love it. And just to make sure that we heard that correctly, I said he drives a 2005 Cadillac. He drives a... I don't know about you, but if I was worth $85 billion, I would have had one of those self-driving Teslas or an um, an armored vehicle that would drive me from point A to point B. But no, he hops in his 2005 Cadillac in his 80s and he drives himself to and from wherever he needs to go to his McDonald's and back. I love the dude. He lives in Omaha, Nebraska, relatively normal place, not California, not New York City. Lives in an ordinary, middle-class neighborhood in a home that, get this, he has lived in for over 50 years. Out of curiosity, how many of you guys have lived in your home that you are living in now for over 50 years? Yeah, that's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Get this. This also blew me away. He doesn't own a smartphone. 
He doesn't have a tablet or any smart device like that. And he's the fourth richest person alive. $85 billion, yet he lives his life like millions of other Americans. Of course, the one big difference is he's worth more than all of us put together in this one room. (laughs) I don't know about you, but it's fun for me to think that the richest and the most powerful and influential people in the world wake up every single day to an annoying alarm just like all of us do. They do. They brush their teeth. They go to the bathroom. They put their Levi 501 jeans on one leg at a time just like us. You see, believe it or not, movie stars, celebrities, Instagram models, and every type of person occasionally wakes up in the morning with a nice big pimple right on their forehead. They just do. On the day you have an interview or the day something big is going on and you just have that nice ingrown hair right on your cheek that everybody can see. That's the facts. Hey, let's get real, right? I guess we got a bunch of perfect skin people here. At least I I do. I have pimples occasionally. You see, there's something about having commonality with people in the world. There's something special about having things in common with the most influential and powerful people. It's just kind of neat. You see, in the end, what is true is that we're all just humans right? We're all just humans inhabiting planet earth, trying to find value and meaning and purpose. And in the text today, we're going to be looking at normal people, average Joes, plain Janes, common folk, people that were just ordinary. And these people were called the shepherds. They were called the shepherds. And there are three things about the shepherds that we're going to point out that hopefully encourage us here today. And so to do that, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2 to where we're going to be looking at these ordinary people, the shepherds, because shepherds are people too. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It will be up on the screen so you can follow along up there as well. Let's read this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Okay. First thing I want to point out, point out about these shepherds is that indeed they were, number one, ordinary people. They were ordinary people. Ordinary people. Now you say, why is this important? Well, here's why. Notice that the first people that were told about the arrival of baby Jesus on planet earth, the first people who heard the announcement about Jesus being born in Bethlehem was not a religious expert. It was not the Richard Dawkins or the Sam Harris's or even the C.S. Lewis's or Jonathan Edwards of the world. It wasn't even announced to a political powerhouse, a place like Egypt, a political powerhouse that could use the birth of baby Jesus, the savior of the world, as a political bargaining chip to grow their empire and power. In fact, you know, I think that if I was God, the way I would announce the arrival of the savior of the world would be through a big giant megaphone. And I would announce to the entire world saying, attention world, in the city of Bethlehem, in the town of Bethlehem, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ is just being born in a manger, go worship him. But he doesn't even do that. They simply announce it to regular old blue collar shepherds, shepherds, ordinary, shepherds who probably smelled like sheep poop. (laughs) who probably had dirt in their fingernails, right? Whose sandals were probably worn in with one toe poking through like some of us in our shoes. They probably had big bags under their eyes from the night watch that they were on. The point is, is that these shepherds were like me and you. They were just ordinary. They were ordinary people. Now, I don't know about you, but it sure does make me happy knowing that the God of the Bible 
cares and communicates with ordinary people like me and like us and like the shepherds. You see, I think one reason why God decided to announce the arrival of Jesus to the shepherds was to show us that no matter who we are, no matter what we do or what we've done, and no matter our reputation, the story of Jesus is meant for us. It's meant for us. It's meant for the nine to fivers, the people that work 300 days a year, wearing in their work boots, coming to uh, home exhausted and tired, out of breath. It's meant for moms and dads who deliriously are changing their kids' diapers at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it's meant for the pancake flippers at Sherry's and Elmer's, the police officers, firefighters, phlebotomists, baristas, bartenders, bank tellers. Single parents, the overlooked, the underused, and the never appreciated person. The story of Jesus is meant for you and me. It's meant for the ordinary. You see, in 2017, there was an incredible study conducted by Pew Research. And in this survey, they surveyed over 7,000 people, and they asked the question. They said, why do you not go to church? Why don't you go to church? And here's what the data found. The data found that 20% of the people said the reason they don't attend church is because they don't feel good enough about themselves. Let that sink in. Why don't you go to church? I feel too ordinary. I feel not very good about myself. I feel like I've messed up one too many times. I'm too basic. I'm too normal. There's no way God would ever think of loving me. You see, this is why the announcement of baby Jesus to the shepherds is so special because he chose to speak to the average Joes and the plain Janes first. See, this is important. One lie that tragically the devil has on repeat for humanity is making people think that in order to come to God, you've got to clean yourself up and get yourself all fixed up in order to be accepted by God. And this is is an incredibly powerful lie that the devil has over people. And the truth is that it's completely not true. It's completely not true. You can never clean yourself up good enough to come to God and act like you got your whole life together by your own accord. That's a fail. In fact, C.S. Lewis, he describes this perfectly in his book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I love C.S. Lewis. He's one of my favorite authors. And in the story, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's a rambunctious, disobedient little boy named Eustace Scrub. Eustace Scrub. And the story goes that Eustace's ship, the Dawn Treader, stopped in an island because it needed to do some repairs. And when they got to the island, the lazy boy got off the ship and he started walking away so he didn't have to do any of the work. It's like the kid who immediately runs outside right when dinner's over and they need to start cleaning the dishes. This is what he did. And so when he was on his walk, he stumbled upon a cave, a big, giant cave. And inside the cave, his eyes widened, his jaw dropped because he saw mountains and mountains of gold. But there was one piece in particular in this gold cave that drew his attention, and it was this golden bracelet. And so the story goes that he walked up to this bracelet, he picked it up, and he put it on his wrist. And right when it went on his wrist, the story goes that he fell into a deep, deep, deep sleep. A few hours go by, and eventually he wakes up, and to his horror, this little 12-year-old boy has turned into a big, scary-looking, fire-breathing dragon. It's crazy, and it caused him a lot of pain because when he turned into a dragon, he uh, grew over 10 times the size that he once was as a little boy into this big, scary dragon, and so the bracelet started digging deep into his skin, and it was making his dragon legs start to bleed profusely, and there was nothing he could do about it. In fact, in the story, it says that Eustace the dragon tried taking his dragon talons, and he would dig deep into his dragon flesh and try to rip off the scales of his dragon flesh tried to fix himself, cutting himself deeply, trying to remove the dragon altogether. Tried over and over and over again, but the more he tried to clean himself, the more he just hurt himself. A few days goes by, and the story goes that Aslan, who is a picture of Jesus, came to the dragon in a dream, and he said, you need to follow me. And so the dragon started flying over, and he t- uh, Aslan the lion took him to a big pool. And there, the lion told him, he said, try to undress yourself, take the bracelet off. And so the little boy, who is now a dragon, tried frantically again. He took his big nails and he started ripping at his wings, trying to get rid of everything that had to do with the dragon on himself. And the story said he tried three times. Blood all over, it was a mess. Aslan was just standing there, and right before Eustace was about to give up, Aslan said, you're going to have to let me help you. And then the story, it says that the big lion 
came on the dragon and he started ripping scales off. Just, just ripping. And eventually he, the big lion, takes, takes the dragon by the mouth and he flops him into the water. And the story goes that right when the dragon hit the water, he transformed back into a little boy. I love C.S. Lewis. You see, what he's trying to show the readers is that it is impossible to try and clean ourselves up. It's impossible. It's impossible. The only way we're ever going to be clean is when we allow God to clean us first. You see, I picture the shepherds in this story standing on these hills, dirty, smelly, (laughs) a little worn out. And I'm thinking to myself, man, what a great picture that is of how you and I were before Jesus cleaned us up. How we were before Jesus threw us in the water and purified us. You see, Psalm 38, verse 4 and 5 says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear, and my wounds fester. Ew. And are loathsome because of my sinful folly. You see, according to the Bible, sin is like a festering, gross wound. It's gross. It's smelly. It's not good. But the good news is that it's in this mess where the grace of God is always going to be most abundant. It's in the mess where his grace is always going to be most abundant. So my question is, is do you feel ordinary? Do you feel painfully normal? The place where you're like, man, God, what could you actually do with me? Do you feel perhaps like you're damaged goods? Maybe made one too many mistakes in your past. And how could God ever do something through me? Do you feel like your life is useless? That's a big one. A lot of people struggle with value. Suicidal thoughts on the brain. The answer is always going to be follow Jesus. Because the story of the Bible is that our God, Jesus Christ, is in the business of taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things through them. Just like the shepherds. Just like the shepherds. Just like you and me. That's the first thing we need to see from this story, is that the shepherds were ordinary people, ordinary folk, just like us. That's number one. Number two, the shepherds were also optimistic. They were optimistic. Verse 15b says this, all the way down to 18. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now, why were they optimistic? Well, here's why. So something I tell uh, our church in Rogue River to do, I tell them to put on their historical helmets because I'm about to take us back in time a little bit to what was going on during this time of this writing. And so here's what we can do. I do this with CAD kids and I do this with the folks in Rogue River and so we're gonna do it together. Here's what we're gonna do. Everybody put put, put your hands up just like this, like you got a helmet and lock it in. Lock it in. You're locked in. History time, folks. Here we go. So during this writing was something called the Pax Romana, the Pax Romana. And what this was, was about a 200-year span of relative peace all throughout the Roman world. It started in 27 BC, and it ended right around 180 BC. Now, here's what we need to know about the Pax Romana, is that while there was relative peace on the outside, there was a lot of persecution on the inside, happening particularly to the Jewish people. And so I'll explain. During these 200 years, roughly 20,000 Jewish slaves were forced to build the Roman Colosseum. And if you know anything about the Colosseum, you know that this was a place that was brutal. Once the Colosseum was done, the Jews then served as one of the main forms of entertainment inside the Colosseum. Jews were fed to lions. They were lit on fire. They were stabbed with spears by gladiators. It was brutal. It was brutality in its wickedest form. Crazy. It was also during this time of the Pax Romana that a psychopath named Nero was alive. And if you don't know who Nero is, this dude is just like issues, man. Like this guy was crazy. Um, Nero brutally tortured Jews and he brutally tortured Christians. Um, He would, just to not go into crazy detail, but he would crucify Christians and light them on fire in the middle of the city square. He would skin people alive in front of their family members. He would dip Christians and Jews in oil, and then he would light them on fire and have them run throughout the city. Crazy. The point is, is that while there was peace on the outside, there was a lot of persecution happening on the inside to the Jewish people. A lot of it. A lot of it. And because of this persecution, you can imagine the Jews were hoping for a savior. 
They were hoping for someone who could save them from their persecution, someone who could lead them to freedom. In fact, in Luke chapter 7, verse 19, a guy by the name of John the Baptist has two of his followers go up to Jesus and ask this question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we be expecting someone else? That's what they ask him. They're like, are you the one? Are you the king? Are you the Jewish king who's going to unify all of us together and restore peace for the Jewish people and lead us to freedom? Are you going to come in on a white horse with a bow and arrow, a shield and a sword and take it to the man? Are you going to lead us to freedom? Are you going to free us? And then with that understanding, look at Luke chapter 2, verse 14. The angels say one word that you and I know for a fact would have touched the shepherds to the core. See if you can find which word it is. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace. Peace. They were optimistic for peace. They wanted peace. And you know, I can't help but think, as I was studying this passage, I can't help but think that what the shepherds were looking for is what we want as well. Truly, peace. You see, the Jewish people were hoping for peace in the world, but they didn't understand something. What they didn't understand if that, is that if world peace is going to be a reality, something happen, has to happen first, and that is that every human heart has to find peace with God first. People always say, you have one wish, what would it be? I'd want world peace. No more wars. World peace cannot exist when individuals do not first experience peace from God. It can't exist. It's impossible. Peace has to happen in the heart before it's ever going to happen in the world. It has to happen in the heart of every person before it's going to happen in the world. And guys, Jesus is all about peace. He's all about peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we, we heard it read earlier today. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of, Prince of Peace. He's all about peace. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. In Psalm 29, 11, David says, The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. It's all about peace. You see, the first song sung about baby Jesus being born on earth has to do with the peace that he's going to offer to every single human heart. I don't know about you guys, but if you're on social media, how many of you guys have a social media account? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, something like that. Some of you are like scared. You're like, I, I guess I do. Uh, you don't want to admit it. Yeah, if you have social media, if you ever read the newspaper, honestly, if you have breath in your lungs, you know that there's a lack of peace in our world today, right? Like, isn't that fair? I think that's a fair thing to say. Like, there's just a lack of peace. Like, I don't have Twitter, but folks, Twitter is nasty. Goodness gracious. Like, Facebook, golly, it's disgusting. It's disgusting, right? There's like these keyboard warriors who are trying to make a difference by hiding behind their keyboard and hurling insults at people, saying things that they would never say in real life. Christians, by the way. This isn't just like, I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about like us. I, I, I was saying, I, was saying I, was, I asked my wife, I said, is this appropriate to say? And she said, eh, why not? Go for it. You're not a rogue river, so what are they going to do? So um, I, 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 I mean, Folks, Donald Trump is not Jesus. Like, like, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of folks I see on Facebook who are acting as if Donald Trump is the embodiment of God himself, thinking that him alone is going to bring peace to the world. Folks, you're so wrong. We're so wrong if we're banking all of our hope for peace on Washington. Golly, what a fail that's going to be. <laughs> the good news for us is that if we really want to experience peace, we need to listen to what the angels were saying then because it applies to us now. There is peace for those on whom his favor rests. There's peace for those on whom his favor rests. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you want to experience the peace of God, God's favor has got to be on your life. So the next, question, the next logical question then would be, well, how do I get favor with God to experience the peace of God? Well, the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Philippians 4, chapter 7, verse says this. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in 
Christ Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read this verse again, and I want us to listen closely, okay? Because this verse right here can unlock the door to experiencing peace in your heart. I'm going to read it. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it's not going to make sense to you why you are experiencing a radical peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, so let, 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 let's say that, ready? We'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. So how do we get the peace of God? Your heart and your mind have got to be in Christ Jesus. The big, the, the big word there is the word in. This isn't halfway in. This isn't three quarters of the way in. It's not one leg in. This is all in, baby. This is all in. In Christ Jesus. The Hebrew word here is pretty cool. It literally translates to a fixed position, like an anchor that is securely fashioned under 20,000 pounds of concrete. It's ready for an atomic bomb to drop on it, and you better believe it's not going anywhere. It's solid. You see, one reason why a lot of us don't experience the peace of God is because we're only connected to a piece of God. So I'm, I'm going to say that again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in fact, I'm going to spell it. One reason a lot of us don't experience the peace, the P-E-A-C-E of God, is because we're only connected to a P-I-E-C-E of God. We're holding on with one hand. If you've ever been on a houseboat, you know that when you're parking the houseboat on the shore, you park it and then you take two ropes from the top of the boat and you anchor it to the shore. And the reason you do that is because it stabilizes it. You don't take one rope and just tie it to the shore because if you do that, the waves and the wind are going to pick your boat up and it's going to fling it from one area to the next and the boat is going to get damaged. You see, the, the truth is that a lot of us are taking a beating in our lives right now because we only have one rope connected to the anchor of peace. So it's no wonder when the waves of our lives throw us around because only a piece of us are holding on to the God of peace. I ride motorcycles, and I better, you better believe that when I'm bombing through a trail going hard with Dan Smith, I have both hands on the handlebars. I don't have one hand on, because I have one hand on, I'm going to hit a tree, and I'm not going to be able to be here today. I'm going to be in the hospital. It's not going to be good. Are you holding on to Jesus? Are you in Christ Jesus? Are you locked in, and are you loaded? Maybe some of us aren't experiencing peace because we're only holding on to a piece of God. Jesus says in John 14, 27, it is peace I leave with you and my peace that I give you. It doesn't take a genius to know that our world is a bleak place right now. There's no doubt about it. But the truth is, is that just like the shepherds, we have something to be optimistic about. You see, if we want to make a difference in the world, here's where we need to start. We need to start in Christ Jesus. Not one hand on Christ Jesus. I'm talking bear hug. In Christ Jesus. Because it's only in Christ Jesus where Optimism is going to be found and peace is going to be experienced. That's the only place. It's the only place. That's number two. Shepherds were optimistic because the peace of God is just derived in human form. Now, what does this peace lead to? Well, thanks for asking. Number three, the shepherds were overjoyed. Number three, overjoyed. Overjoyed. Verse 20, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You see, when an ordinary person like a shepherd experiences the peace of God, the natural response is that of joy. It's that of joyfulness. In verse 20, it says that they glorified, praised, and testified of the things they had just seen and heard. One commentator I read put it this way, and I thought this was kind of fun, and it made me smile, and I hope it makes you smile. He said this, the shepherds were amazed, and then they praised. I like that. They were amazed, and then they praised. They were in wonder, and then they worshiped. I love it. While the sheep graze, we got a wrapper up in here, Faith. I like it. So my question for us is this. What brings you joy? What brings you joy in your life? Maybe for some of us, it was <laughs> Black Friday. And getting 50% off that flat screen 4K Roku TV. <laughs> Maybe for some of us, it was when we got that killer deal on the new hot sensation, an air fryer. I don't know. Everybody's up in arms about those these days. <laughs> Maybe for some of us, the only times we experience joy is when we get promotions at work, right? Or our boss notices the hard work that we're doing, going above and beyond. Maybe for some of us, the moments of joy have to do with our children's successes and their triumphs in life. And if we're being true, we live vicariously through them. See, all of these things are good. Don't get me wrong. 
50% off of flat screen TVs, a, a great thing. But during this month of December, here's how I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us to recognize the importance of Advent. To recognize the importance of Advent. You see, some of us may not know this, and I hope we do as we're, as we're going through this. Advent literally means the arrival of a person, a thing, or an event. See, the month of December can be hectic, guys. Like, I don't think there's any month in the year that flies by as fast as December, right? It's crazy. There's so many distractions, right? There's snowmen, elves on the shelves, reindeer, Santa Claus, horrible Hallmark movies, and it's just, it's, it's crazy. Yes, I said horrible Hallmark movies. I'm taking shots. <laughs> they're horrible. Newsflash, they're all the same. They fall in love. Christmas happens. Good news. <laughs> It's easy to be distracted during December. It's easy. It's so easy. But above all of this, I, what I want us to just never forget is that the infinite infant, Jesus Christ, came to earth as a little baby boy. He came to earth. So again, I ask, do you feel ordinary? Do you feel like you are longing for hope and peace in this world? The words of the angel still apply to us today like they applied to the shepherds long ago. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. There is an infinite amount of peace available to you and me. There is joy found in Jesus, all because of this one event, baby Jesus coming to earth as a human. So don't ever feel like damaged goods. Don't think the world is too far, God. You have a joy and you have a peace that can never be taken from you because it's securely placed in Jesus Christ. That is a reason to be optimistic. Praise God he uses ordinary folk. Praise God we have peace. And praise God we have something to be joyful about. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's, uh, let's pray.